In this video, I'm going to be walking you through my general approach to PE management, and we're going to be talking about things like the PERC, the Wells Criteria, uh, D-dimer testing, as well as the utility of imaging. For more educational resources, like our medical ID cards, check out medicalbasics.com. So I think this diagram summarizes it very well of how we actually manage PEs. And so it kind of breaks down when should you use the PERC, when should you use the Wells Criteria, D-dimer testing, as well as imaging. And it's offered by the American College of Physicians, and it's the guidelines for PE management. So definitely something you can check out, but I'll kind of walk you through this diagram in a second. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about is actually the PERC test. Um, and it stands for the Pulmonary Embolism Rule Out Criteria. And it wasn't a test that I heard of very much about until I got it to my emergency medicine rotation. And it's rightfully so. It's a test that we use to rule out PEs. And so it just gives you some scientific backing that if somebody were to ask, well, why aren't you sending a, a D-dimer? Why aren't you sending any type of CT? Have you thought about PE? Well, you can say, well, their PERC score was zero and they essentially perked out. They do not need to get any additional testing and we can send them home, at least from the PE standpoint. So the way that it works is something that you don't necessarily need to memorize. It's something on MD Calc, uh, but it's also very intuitive. If they get anything that is positive, they get a score of one. And if anything is positive, so if they have a score of one or greater, they automatically, you cannot rule out a PE and you have to do additional testing. However, if everything is zero, right, meaning that they met the criterion of their low age, they're not tachycardic, they have good oxygen, they do not have any unilateral leg swelling, they have no hemoptysis, no surgery or trauma, no history of, of DVT, and no estrogen use. If all of this is true and they have a score of zero, you can essentially say that they are their perk is negative and that they do not need any additional PE workup. So just looking at this diagram right here, if they were a low risk based off their history and we did a perk and they were negative, essentially you do not need to do any additional PE workup. However, if they were positive, then we need to start thinking about getting a D-dimer and then potentially imaging. And I've been talking about low, intermediate, and high risk, but how do we think about that? Well, the criteria that you often probably would hear, especially on internal medicine, is the Wells criteria. And the kind of it's very similar to the PERC um, in terms of the actual criteria. Uh, they're mainly just symptoms or risk factors for PE, but the point system is a little bit different. So any clinical signs or symptoms of DVT, any PE is the most likely diagnosis, tachycardia, surgery or immo immobilization, any history of DVT or PE, hemoptysis or active malignancy, they'll get a certain number of points. And all of this is on MD Calc, so it's not something you have to memorize the score, but more just understand the concept that these are risk factors or uh, symptoms of PE. And based off their score, if they have less than two, they're low risk. If they're two to six, they're at intermediate risk. And if they're greater than six, they're in, in the high risk group. And that'll kind of put you through these different categories and estimate what you're going to be doing next. The modified Wells criteria is using the same exact criteria, using the same exact point system, but it's just really, if you can't remember the zero to two, two to six, greater than six, it just has two categories. PE is unlikely, less than four. P is likely, greater than four. So I mentioned the D-dimer test before, and this was a test that we really only use in the intermediate group. And the reason why we don't use it in the high risk is because it's not a test that is great at confirming PEs. It's a great test to rule out PEs. So if you were pretty confident that this patient did not have a PE and you were confident that they, they were going to have a negative D-dimer, then you should get a D-dimer test because if it's negative, then no imaging is indicated. However, if it's positive, then you really aren't sure. You're not going to just start treating them just because they have a positive D-dimer. You're still going to get additional imaging. Imaging. Um, the reason why is because a lot of things can potentially cause a positive D-dimer. It's a very sensitive test, but not very specific, not very specific specifically to PE. And so that's why it's great to rule out a PE, but bad to actually confirm a PE. So we really only use a D-dimer if we're sure uh, that we can rule it out. And then if not, if we're kind of more suspicious and the pretest probability is fairly high, we're going to go straight to imaging. And the actual imaging that we're going to be getting is going to be a CT uh, with a PE protocol is what it's typically called in most hospitals. And you can see that they have these bilateral uh, PEs uh, where the contrast is bright and then the PEs are dark and there's actually no flow uh, past this clot. Be sure to check out medicalbasics.com for more educational resources like our HP notebook. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more tips and lessons.